In 1934, King Carl, the meal ticket of the Giants, enjoyed a unique triumph. Carl had been consistently in the National League's leading pitchers, generally good for 20 or so wins a year. In the All-Star Game of 34, the King struck out Ruth, Gary, Fox, Simmons, and Cronin in a row. Another one for the record books. It was the month of June 1938. There may have been some distractions from baseball with the rumblings from Europe, but America's national pastime was still also on the front pages. Johnny Vandermeer, a Cincinnati Red, threw two no-hitters in two consecutive games. First on June 11th against the Braves, and then in Brooklyn on June 15th. In the American League, Bob Feller became known as our Sunday pitcher. He was to become baseball's number one pitcher, having learned his art by pitching into an apple barrel in his hometown, Van Meter, Iowa. Also in 1938, there was the incredible home run by Gabby Hartnett in Chicago in late September. It was the bottom of the ninth with two men out and a man at bat with two strikes going. That man was Gabby, who went on to hit a home run stunning the crowd and putting himself in the record books, hanging the previously front-running pirates their defeat. Number four, that was Lou Gehrig of the New York Yankees, and he was saying goodbye. Today, I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. The man whose locker was next to Gehrig's was the babe, the Sultan of Swat. His locker was number five. As long as they played together on the fabled Yankee team, the two men were at the top of their class. But I might have been given a bad break, but I've got an awful lot to look for. Thank you. After all the speeches and the crowd's emotional response, it was the Bambino who walked arm in arm with Lou Gehrig back to the Yankee dugout. What baseball memories reside in those two? Ruth and Gehrig. But the sport moves on. It had been 20 years since Cincinnati had flown a pennant over their stadium. Crosley Field was the scene of the triumphs of pitchers Bucky Walters and Paul Derringer and batters Lombardi, Goodman, and McCormick. Hitting played an important part of that year's Yankee win led by batter King Kong Keller. The years seemingly blend into each other, faster and faster. Names and pictures, records and achievements, they start to blur into each other. Dizzy Dean, who with his brother Daffy played baseball for the fun of it, as well as the earnings it made, Dean had said that when I don't have it no more, I'll, I'll quit. Well, he did just that in 1939. During a game between the Cubs and the Phils, Dizzy took his final hike, walking into the twilight of a notable career. 1941, Ted Williams. For the first time since Bill Terry 10 years earlier, Baseball had a real 400 full season hitter. Williams was scrupulous in his method of play. He would make scientific studies into his improvement, including wind direction and speed when he was scheduled for Boston's Fenway Park. Same year, another legend. Joe DiMaggio, Jolton Joe, created an incredible hitting streak from May 15th to July 16th with at least one hit in every game. 56 hits later, the streak ended. 
but it was another of baseball's record entries. In Brooklyn's first pennant win in two decades, the Dodgers were managed by Lippy Leo DeRocher, whose stars of the moment included Dolph Camilli and Pete Reeser. tables were turned so dramatically that baseball felt the percussions for years. Thus it seemed as if the Yankees had lost some of their swagger. Since 1926 they had been akin to gods, but in 1943 once again the Yanks started to strut winning the American League pennant. You take nine hustling ball players who work together and who play the game for all there is in it, and you have got a ball club that the opposing teams will find hard to beat. Mr. McCarthy certainly had a goal in mind. He wanted some Cardinals to eat crow for the activities of the year before. October arrived with the series in hand, and indeed, it was the Yankees facing the Cardinals. St. Louis fans were hoping for a quick and easy victory. But the Cardinals were run over by the Yankees, who had superior hitting working for them. In the American League, no team was so familiar with the cellar floor as the St. Louis Browns. In 1944, the Brownies amazed all by winning the American League pennant. That year, they faced the Cardinals, for whom championship wasn't new. So that series was a case history of the game. First off, with two teams from the same city on opposing sides. For the winning Cardinals, the playing of Stan Musial and George Marion, endowed with a team of depth and experience, added to great pitching. It also had the honors of being the championship heard around the world, being broadcast to the United States World War II fighting forces. The Cards won four games to three. Even so, the Browns certainly put up a game and valiant effort. It would be the last series played by two teams in the same stadium. And if baseball commissioner Judge Landis hadn't objected to the level of couth as projected by Dizzy Dean, Another page in history that of radio broadcast with the Diz announcing might have been. 1945, before the year was out, servicemen would start to return to baseball from the World War just concluded. During the war years, fans had stayed away from the ballparks. The war effort was uppermost in America's minds. Looking back, it can be seen that the years of World War II had certainly changed baseball during that time. Teams experienced roller coaster-like changes as players left for the service. The absence of gate-busting crowds also contributed to sometimes lackluster and sporadic quality play. Years earlier, Branch Rickey had begun the creation of a system of farm clubs, minor league teams whose existence was to groom and grow future players for the Cardinals. When Ricky had the idea, it was viewed as interesting but questionable. Now, farm clubs are completely accepted and understood in the quality of baseball play as we near the 21st century. We have the best training camp in Florida as far as the grounds are concerned. This infield is great shape, and boys take pleasure in uh, performing on it. And while we're harping on changes, good and bad, we'd like to jump forward to the mid-50s briefly, as Brooklyn Dodgers owner Walter O'Malley tries to convince the New York City fathers to support a radical and untried idea. O'Malley proposed building an enclosed and covered baseball stadium so never again would a game be called due to the weather. Borough infighting called politics ended up with the Brooklyn club getting a vote of non-support. 
So O'Malley started to pack his bags. The Dodgers left for Los Angeles shortly after. The city of Houston would become the first to take the honors by erecting their version of O'Malley's idea. It would be called the Astrodome, and it would be the first of its kind in the world. Voltaire said that there are no real pleasures without real needs. Now a young, ambitious, and growing nation needs to let off steam. Baseball furnishes the opportunity. Therefore, it is a real pleasure. Baseball is second only to death as a leveler. So long as it remains our national game, America will abide no monarchy, and anarchy will be too slow. Alan Sangree, 1907. teams pretty much dominated the 1950s. There were five subway series, that is, teams playing from the same city, and 14 of the 20 teams to play in the World Series were from New York. The 50s saw the Giants and the Dodgers leave for California. kids from Philadelphia, so named because they were so young, made it to the World Series. In 1951, rookie Willie Mays was brought up from the Myers to play center field. The 
Giants made a run at the Dodgers and tied them with one game left to go. On the last day, Bobby Thompson's shot heard round the world home run, beat the Dodgers and won the pennant. Willie Mays won the Rookie of the Year, and well deserved. The Yankees won the World Series in six games. In 1952, Mickey Mantle's power won the pennant and the World Series for the Yankees, despite losing Joe DiMaggio, who retired in 1951. Bob Feller had a poor season, ending up with a record of 9 and 13. Robin Roberts had a great season, winning 28 games, the most since Dizzy Dean won 28 in 1935. The Dodgers won the pennant. Willie Mays was called into military service, which hurt the Giants. The Yankees won the World Series with Mickey Mantle's home runs and Yogi Berra's consistent good hitting. Duke Snyder was the standout player for the Dodgers. Stan Musial, Ralph Kiner, and Bobby Shantz were great players in 52. Ted Williams was taken back into the Air Force to fight in Korea. The great Satchel Paige shut out Detroit in 12 innings. And he was 47 years old at the time, or so he said. Larry Doby was the leader in runs with 104, and homers with 32. In 1953, the Milwaukee Braves were the new kids on the block, having moved from Boston. The Dodgers again had a great team with Roy Campanella's 312 batting average, 41 home runs, and a league high 142 RBIs. Jackie Robinson and Gil Hodges all hit above 300, and Junior Gilliam was named Rookie of the Year. The Yankees still won the World Series in six games. Bob Lemon won 23 games, and Early Win also won 23. Mike Garcia also had 19 victories. This was the year of the great Willie Mays catch off the bat of Big Works. Dusty Rhodes hit two game-winning homers and drove in seven runs in only six series at bats. The Giants swept the Indians four straight. the Dodgers were on the move and ended up playing the New York Yankees. But this time they vowed they weren't going to lose again. But New York started out taking the first two games. The Dodgers didn't give up. And they won the third game 8-3. Duke Snyder homered to win the game for the Dodgers. They won the next one 5-3 and now had to go back to Yankee Stadium. The Yankees took the next game, but the Dodgers finally won the World Series by beating the Yankees in Game 7. In 1956, the Yankees won again, but Don Larson did something that had never been done before. He pitched a perfect game, the only one in World Series history. It happened in Game 5 and put the Yankees up three games to two.
Mickey Mantle won the Triple Crown, hitting 353 with 52 homers and 132 RBIs. Jackie Robinson retired and the Yankees signed their first black player, Elston Howard. In 1957, the Braves won the National League pennant and played the Yankees in the World Series. The Braves won it in seven games as Lou Burdett had three World Series wins, including two shutouts. Hank Aaron and Mickey Mantle were the MVPs. In 1958, the Dodgers moved to Los Angeles and the Giants moved to San Francisco. The Yankees won their fourth straight pennant and the Braves repeated as pennant winners in the National League. The Yankees took the World Series in seven games. Ted Williams won the batting title at age 40. Roy Campanella was injured in an auto accident and was permanently paralyzed below the waist. He was confined to a wheelchair. In 1959, the White Sox won their first flag in 40 years, and the Dodgers won their first West Coast flag. Los Angeles won the World Series in six games. Hank Aaron won the batting crown in the National League with 355. In 1960, the Yankees had the one-two punch of Roger Maris, who had 39 homers, and Mickey Mantle, who blasted 40 home runs. The Pirates won their first flag since 1927. Then they went on to beat the Yankees in seven games. In 1961, the Yankees hit 240 home runs. Eight extra games were added to the schedule, allowing Roger Maris to break Babe Ruth's record of 60 home runs. Mantle and Maris were in the race for the most home runs right to the end of the season. Waiting to see if Maris is going to hit number 61. Here's the windup. Fastball hit. Maris hit his 61st on the final day of the season. The following year, 1962, saw Maury Wills steal 104 bases and break Ty Cobb's record. He won the Most Valuable Player Award. The Yankees won their third straight pennant. And the Giants won the National League pennant in a playoff. The Dodgers' big gun pitcher was Don Drysdale. The Yankees won the series in seven games. Sandy Koufax was a big record breaker starting in 1962 and running for five straight years. In 1963, the Yankees won their fourth straight flag, and the Dodgers won the pennant in the National League. Sandy Koufax won two games in the World Series as the Dodgers swept the Yankees. The first time since 1922. Koufax wins Most Valuable Player and the Cy Young Award, and sets a new modern National League record with 306 strikeouts. Pete Rose wins Rookie of the Year. In 1964, the Yankees won their fifth consecutive flag in the American League, and the Cards emerge on top in the National League. The Cards win the World Series in seven games, the first time that the Yankees have been beaten twice in a row in the series, the first time since 1922. Bob Gibson won two of three games, including the clincher. In 1965, the Dodgers won the National League flag as Sandy Koufax had another great year, leading the National League in wins with 26, striking out 382, 
and winning his second Cy Young Award. The Twins won their first American League flag since 1933, but the Dodgers beat them in the World Series in seven games after losing the first two in Minnesota. Sandy Koufax had two shutouts in the series and fanned 29 batters in that series. Harmon Killebrew led the majors with 49 homers. Houston opened the first indoor stadium, the Astrodome. At 65 years of age, Satchel Paige is the oldest to play in a major league game when he hurls three scoreless innings for Kansas City against Boston. In 1966, the Dodgers repeat as National League champs and the Orioles take their first flag since the move to Baltimore. The Dodgers batted only 142 in the entire series. Koufax won 27 games that year, but had to retire because of a bad elbow. In 1967, Kyle Yastrzemski hit 400 and led the Red Sox to the American League pennant. The Cards won the National League flag and went on to win the World Series in seven games. Rod Carew won Rookie of the Year. In 1968, the Detroit Tigers won the American League flag by 12 games, as Denny McLean won 31 games, the first pitcher since Dizzy Dean in 1934 to win over 30 games. The Cards won the pennant and had Bob Gibson pitching for them. But Detroit's Mickey Lolich won three games and the Tigers were champs in seven. Al Kaline won the sixth game with a single and Jim Northrup hit a triple that scored the winning runs in game seven. In 1969, Mickey Mantle retired, and the amazing Mets won the pennant. They played the Orioles in the World Series, and the Orioles were heavily favored. After losing the opener, the Mets beat the Orioles four straight games to become the world champs. In 1970, Denny McLean, two-time Cy Young Award winner, was suspended twice because of his involvement with the underworld. He later would serve a jail sentence. The Orioles beat the Reds in five games in the World Series. In 1971, Vita Blue was the young standout pitcher won the World Series from the Orioles in seven games. Also in 1972, Rod Carew became the first player to win the batting crown without hitting a single home run. beat the Reds in seven games to win the World Series. In 1973, the American League started the designated hitter rule. Nolan Ryan broke Sandy Koufax's single season strikeout record with a total of 383. and the A's beat the Mets in seven in the World Series. In 1974, Hank Aaron broke Babe Ruth's record of 713 home runs.
The A's beat the Dodgers in five games in the World Series. Seventy-six, the Reds won the World Series again, sweeping the Yankees in four games. Mike Schmidt hit four of his 38 home runs in a single game. The Yankees beat the Dodgers in the World Series in 77 and 78. Reggie Jackson hit three home runs in game six in 77. And Lou Brock broke Ty Cobb's record with 35 stolen bases. 42-year-old Gaylord Perry won the Cy Young Award in 78. In 1979, the Pirates beat the Orioles in the World Series, and the average player's salary shot up to $113,000. Players' pay approached the $1 million mark for the first time. One of the most exciting decades was the 80s. The World Series was won by the Orioles, the Tigers, the Royals, the Mets, the Twins, and the A's. Pete Rose got his 4,192nd hit in 1985 to break the record, and Oral Hershiser's consecutive scoreless inning streak was accomplished in 1988. The two biggest shakeups in 1989 were Fernando Valenzuela and his Fernando Mania, and the San Francisco earthquake that postponed the World Series. 89 was also the year that Pete Rose was banned from baseball for gambling on the Reds. The 90s gave us stars like Daryl Strawberry, Jose Canseco, Roger Clements. And the Reds and Twins won the World Series in the early 90s before the Toronto Blue Jays became the first non-American team to win the series. Yes, but there's part of that selection that's supposed to really represent a cat walking on the keyboard. So if you'll lend me your ears, I'll demonstrate to you just how a good, modern, upright, conscientious, self-respecting cat should walk on the key. That's a great idea, Mr. Gay. Why don't you do that on the radio? Gee, that is a great idea, babe. How would you do it? Well, let me show you. Ball one. Strike one. A home run. Great. Get it. Get it. Get it. Get it. <laughs> All right. Oh, no, wait a minute. Don't forget. 
that. It's a home run. Oh, <laughs> that's what that is. Now, ladies and gentlemen, coming into the studio, it's the great Babe Ruth himself. Come on, Babe. Hey, what is uh, what am I supposed to do here? You're supposed to tell these millions of people listening in just what you're going to do on the air. Well, I can't tell a crowd that I can't see. Oh, say there's nothing to it. Babe, go right to it and see. I'll bet you can do it. Oh, well, hello, folks. My two friends and myself have written a number called Home Run on the Key. We're jumping into the studio like this, of sudden, why, we figure we got two strikes on us already. But remember, you only have one to hit. So, David, play it. Okay. 